सो नमस्कार लर्नर्स वेलकम टू दिस सेकेंड लेक्चर ऑन द इंट्रोडक्शन टू ह्यूमन फैक्टर इंजीनियरिंग विच इज ऑल्सो कॉल इंजीनियरिंग साइकोलॉजी लेक्चर वन वी डिस्कस्ड द बेसिक ऑफ ह्यूमन इंजीनियरिंग इन टर्म्स ऑफ वॉट इट कंप्राइजेस एंड वॉट आर द वेरिएबल्स दैट इट प्लेज विथ I gave a definition of what human factor engineering is all about and we discussed how engineering psychology is not engineering per se but modifying or engineering psychology to solve problems related to human system or human machine interactions in the definition we looked at how knowledge from psychology can be applied to the understanding of human machine interactions focusing both on the limitations and capabilities of humans in terms of psychological inputs as well as looking at the limitations and capabilities of systems in terms of the engineering input so the science of engineering psychology is focused more on studying the interaction then we discussed what is the subject matter of this field of engineering psychology and there we discussed how human engineering or engineering psychology per se looks at the cognitive the physical capacities of humans as well as the cognitive and physical limitations of human beings human beings come equipped with a lot of cognitive abilities and physical abilities but they are limited by the nature of the task that they are doing and the nature of learning that they have so what engineering psychology does is it looks at how these limitations and capabilities can supplement the use of machines and with this increase productivity and performance we also discussed how environments in which the humans and machine interaction goes to play how they can be designed further we looked at what aspects of engineering psychology is necessary for a study and there we looked at the physical aspect the social aspect and other range of other aspects which form the subject matter or field of engineering psychology further to it we also looked at what are the different limitations and capabilities in terms of sensory and cognitive capabilities of humans and how these capabilities can be addressed through this science of engineering psychology we also discussed how the field of human engineering has a strong emphasis on engineering and we discussed the field of ergonomics towards the end of the lecture we discussed how engineering psychology is a interdisciplinary field and how models and methods of study from computer science architecture biology medicine to name a few can be used to develop solutions to problem in the field of engineering psychology one good example in terms of cognitive science and computer science interface that we discussed in the last class is the information processing model now this model which is used in cognitive science has been borrowed from computer science and this shows how information is processed now the predictions of the model from the computer science it, uh, stream can be built upon and the functioning of the brain can be studied through it similarly knowledge from architecture and biology and medical sciences can be modified worked upon and included into the study of engineering problems or 
human machine relation related problems. The focus of today's lecture will be discussing a little bit history about this field of engineering psychology, where did it come from and further to it we will look at some applications of engineering psychology and towards the end we will also discuss the system approach. Now, studying how humans are fit to work with machines is the purview of IO psychology or industrial and organization psychology. So, how is human engineering different from industrial and organization psychology or the IO psychology? What I would like to suggest here is that in a number of ways both the field are similar. IO psychology helps in understanding how individuals fit in larger organization systems and engineering psychology looks at how individuals and organ, uh, organizations or larger systems should work together. So, where is the difference? What is the difference? Let us look at uh, this in today's lecture. Industrial and organization psychology and engineering psychology they complement each other. A number of engineering psychologists are hired by people in industries or people who study industry and large organization system and individuals to create a more beneficial environment so that performance can be improved. But there are a number of differences. One primary difference between the subject matter of engineering psychologists and industrial and organization psychologists is what kind of analysis they perform. The industrial and organization psychologists they look at something called job analysis. What is job analysis? In job analysis job is evaluated, the task is evaluated and individuals are trained and uh, they are selected in such a way so that these individuals fit the job. In direct opposition to this is the idea of task analysis which is used in human engineering or engineering psychology. In engineering psychology it is the task that is studied and it is seen what are the requirements of the task and based on these requirements and the capabilities and limitations of human cognitive and physical systems, the task is modified so as to have a better human machine relations. So, on one hand the IO psychology looks at training and selecting people to fit the job, engineering psychologists look at how systems can be modified or designed so that they fit the humans. So, the approaches differ here. IO psychology is more about personal selection, selecting people who fit a job and as we discussed the engineering psychology look at how the presently working people and the presently working system can be studied and modified in such a way that the interactions become more fruitful and performance increases. Industrial organization psychology focus on training whereas, engineering psychology works on redesigning or remodeling of systems. The industrial organization psychology looks at performance appraisal and management, but the basis of engineering psychology is about user centered design and looking at how users can be studied and the capabilities and limitations of users can be used into redesigning systems. Organization psychology is more about organization design, change and culture 
engineering psychology is about systems, system processes and redesigning of system and the study of capabilities and limitations uh, of humans in terms of their cognitive and physical aspects. IO psychology is about leadership whereas engineering psychology is about understanding the relation between man machine system. Now, although these are the points of deviation between engineering psychology and uh, industrial and organization psychology, there are some similarities at, as I discussed at the beginning of uh, this lecture. So, human factors also include training and some personal selection. So, they also look at how people can be trained to fit certain kind of system applications. But this is limited. Mainly the focus of engineering psychology is studying how the relationship between the man and machine can be bettered, improved so that there is an increase in performance and a better working environment for the, uh, for the user and the machine. Also human factor engineering or engineering psychology uses the principles of organization design which basically means that how organizations and environments in organization are modified to suit the operators who are working with the machines. In addition, there are the perspectives differences between IO psychology and engineering psychology and we have discussed this before, but in a very brief way, the perspective of industrial and organization psychology is selecting training people to fit jobs, whereas the perspective that is taken by engineering psychology is understanding capabilities and limitations of the operator in the cognitive and physical uh, domain understanding the capabilities and limitations of systems, then matching the map and remodifying the in, uh, design of the system so that humans do not fit machines, but machines sort of complement human actions. So, this is where the difference in perspective occurs. Now, let us look at a brief history of human factor engineering or engineering psychology. There are two major landmarks in the history, one before the start of World War II and second after the start of World War II. The World War II is thought of as the turning point of engineering psychology. Why did this happen? It was during World War II that a number of machines came into picture. Nazis were flying planes and U-boats and submarines and they were facing a number of difficulties in terms of operations of these machines. The best thing that they thought was training the operator to use the machine, but that was where the problem occurred. The machine was made and the operator was trained and because of that a number of problems arose. So, there is where this science of engineering psychology it emerged with full force and there is where people from experimental psychology and other disciplines came to the rescue of the operator machine relations and that is why the world war II is thought of as a turning point for the history. So, before world war I there is a brief history between world war I and world war II there is a small uh, point uh, uh, during which the history can be defined. And after World War II, a lot of history exists in engineering psychology. For the purpose of clarification, 
this history is divided into two parts before world war 2 in terms of the age of machines which starts from 1750 to 1870 and the age of power which starts from 1870 to 1945. Then came the world war and everything changed because here people from the experimental psychology and cognitive psychology background were called to study machines, to study humans, to study their interactions and redesign machine in such a way that performance increased. After world war II, we have the age of machines since 1945 and still it is going on. So, one by one let us look at all these divisions in the history of development of engineering psychology. Let us look at the first linkage which I described a little while ago which is before world war I or for the proper classification let us call this as before world war II. Prehistoric linkages. Technically speaking the science of engineering psychology started with the advent of early humans learning the use of stone tools and building of homes. So, in very brief way it can be said that the history date backs to the stone age and when people learn how to live in groups and do cultivation because at that point early humans realized that stones and other metals can be used for making tools and uh, other equipments which can help them living a better life and ward off enemies. But this is a long history and it is not documented to. So, our study of engineering psychology per se will start from the year 1748. Why this is a landmark year? Because it is during this year that a book called La Home Machina was published by La Matters. What was the highlight of this book? The highlight of this book was that humans can be compared with machines and why this comparison was done? If humans can be compared to machines, then whatever the machine does can be mapped onto what human does as a behavior and it can be studied. So, this publication of this book which is La Home Machina marked the first phase of the history of engineering psychology and that is from 1750 to 1870. One advantage of comparing simple and complex machines to humans was that human behavior can then be predicted and not only human behavior but also performance and proficiencies of humans can be studied in terms of how machines function. Now, most machines have predictable ways of working and humans are uh, unpredictable. The simple reason being that individual differences and uh, behaviors, human behavior is not a fixed process but it is a random process. It is a more probabilistic process, a probabilistic approach human behavior takes rather than a stochastic approach which most machines take. So, to understand human behavior in fixed terms, in stochastic terms, it was compared to how machines perform and by doing that, a measure of behavior, performance, proficiencies, capabilities of humans could be devised and this was one advantage of the coming up of this book and comparing of human behavior to machines. The second landmark 
in the study of human engineering came with the age of power. Before the age of power, simple machines were there, hand driven tools and humans were compared to these tools and performances were rated in terms of performance or of machines. With the age of power, the advent of power machinery in transportation, industry, agriculture and other fields came in. This is where the first power engine, steam power engine, the power loom, the power rotor came into existence and with the use of energy and power, humans could now offload their task onto machines which performed it more efficiently and more powerfully. This is for the first time when humans realized that machines can be made as slaves to help them in their work. It is within the age of power that the time and motion studies were carried out by Taylor and Gilbert. What this time and motion studies did was they looked at how certain actions in time are performed and how they can be documented. We will discuss this in the next uh, step. So, what is time and motion studies? Taylor and Gilbert use scientific methods to document physical movements made by workers in execution of task. So, let us take a simple machine which could be the tilling machine through which you sow crops in the field. Now, these simple tillers are made up of iron and they are carried forward by some uh, animal. There is a conical section in which you feed in the seeds of the grain. The animal pulls this conical structure. The end of this conical structure is pointed so that it can enter the earth surface, the soil and make furrows. So, if you apply too much pressure, the animal which is pulling it will not be able to pull it for long and if you apply too less pressure on this conical structure of, of the seed sower, it will not be able to penetrate the soil and put the seeds at an appropriate length. What time and motion studied would do is look at how this whole action of sowing goes about, how much time each action takes and what can be modified in this simple machine so that more seeds can be sown in lesser time. Plus, the animals also do not get to overburden. So, basically time motion studies were looking at time against motion, time against activities that humans do on machines. How to reduce time of usage and improve efficiency in terms of curtailing motions or redefining motions that people do with machines. By reorganization of tasks to eliminate unnecessary movements. Both Taylor and Francis were able to improve the efficiency and reduce fatigue. So, why were they looking at these time motion studies uh, for a simple machine like the seed sower? By redesigning the machine in certain ways, a number of unnecessary movements can be eliminated so that the physical energy of people can be saved. It would also improve the efficiency as in how many seeds or how much hectares of land are sown and it would reduce the fatigue both on the animals and the human who is sowing the seed. This way more work and good performance would happen with lesser effort and better design machines and this was the reason behind the time motion studies. What was the main 
output of these time motion studies? The first was both Taylor and Gilbert realized that if plant breaks are taken, this would help improving performance. With breaks in between tasks, humans would get a chance to re-energize and through this re-energizing, both physical and mental workload would reduce and people will become more efficient. Also redesigning of tools was suggested by time motion studies and the shovel, uh, a popular tool which is used in a number of construction work that was redesigned by uh, the duo Taylor and Gilbert and it were designed in such a way so that lesser effort, human effort is needed for more performance. This time and motion studies and the output of time and motion studies got a name and this name was the study of scientific management or how management can be done in a scientific way. So, this whole field was now called the field of scientific management. One major highlight of this time motion studies was that Taylor and Gilbert soon realized that because people are different, they have differences among themselves. There was no single best solution for design of problems. So, there can cannot be a single design or an ideal design that can serve for all humans. Some humans have good physical capacity, some good cognitive capacity and people differ. So, they realize from the studies that there cannot be one design for all type of humans. So, what they did was they proposed a solution to this and what was it? They proposed that design should not be for the ideal user, but for all users. So, rather than making one design or one standard design, which most production houses or companies would think of one product for all, we should focus on how that one product can be modified in such a way that it can include a number of users, the use for a number of users. So, this was one good output or suggestion from the time and motion studies. Another psychologist who was working during this time was Gilbert and he studied bricklaying. He looked at masons who were laying bricks and what he found out is that most masons do a number of unnecessary activities and because of these unnecessary activities, the performance were very poor. So, he studied bricklaying through the time and motion procedure and found out that if these masons eliminate certain motions which are unnecessary, they can save their energy and reduce the fatigue. He saw that masons were doing a number of actions which were not necessary and that was creating fatigue. One good example is, think about how people lay brick. They start from the ground up and till the point that it reaches their shoulder level. Now, when they are laying bricks at the ground level, they are sitting and they are taking the brick and it is, the brick is very near to the hand. But when they are standing, they have to each time bend back, pick up the brick and then lay uh, the brick. This creates physical fatigue and lowers the performance. So, by looking at this, Gilbert designed something called the scaffold. What is the scaffold? The scaffold would always keep the brick layer at the knee level in a sitting position and when he is mostly sitting and the same action he is performing again and again, then he does not have to waste his energy in terms of bending backward 
and performing other actions which can reduce his efficiency. The scaffold goes up as the brick wall goes up and this reduces unnecessary movement. So, Gilbert helped design the scaffold in brick work and not only this, Gilbert and his wife Gillian Gilbert, they also studied the medical science field and operations. They found out that during operations a number of actions are done by the doctor which are not necessarily needed. So, they standardized the procedure of how surgical equipment should be kept in a tray while opera operation and with this standard procedure the number of movements that the surgeon does would be reduced and the chances of operational errors or operation related problems would get reduced. So, they designed this standard tool laying framework. Now, we come to the second phase of the history of uh, engineering psychology and that is during and after World War II. The field of engineering psychology was firmly established during World War II and the reason for that is a large number of errors associated with the use of military equipments and aircraft accidents. As I explained before, during World War II, a number of war related equipments were created. These are very good equipments, but they were designed for the ideal user. Now, humans being differ and because of that the operators had their own capacities and limitations and they could not fit the ideal user machine. So, sometimes because of certain capacity related problems or physical problems, some actions were performed by the operator because of which the machine failed and a number of accidents were occurring. To solve this problem, industrial and organization psychologists were called in and the best they did was they studied the job and based on that they trained people into using these machines. But as you have looked before, this is not the solution. The simple reason, reason being that no matter how much training you provide to people, they tend to create mistakes and because of that a lot of accidents were still happening. So, how was this problem solved? Individuals who were trained in experimental psychology, they were recruited to apply the knowledge of sensation, perception and learning theories to design equipments. People who study humans, particularly experimental psychologists like me, they know the capacities of the cognitive system, how much the eye can see, what is the way in which it perceives 3D motion, where does it fail, what is peripheral vision and how is it different from foveal vision in terms of perception, how the top down process sometimes takes over the bottom up processes and create illusions or how perception of motion happens in terms of learning theories, the principles of reward, the principles of positive and negative reward and positive and negative punishment, the idea of social learning theory, all these aspects of human psychology, they were applied to problems that were present and these theories helped design the system in such a way that it fits the users. Not that the users were not modified as such, they were also given training, but these trainings were made in such a way that fits their capabilities and whatever was left, whatever the humans could not do in terms of exceeding their capacities, that job was given to the machines. A simple example is while flying a plane, a number of checks have to be done in the cockpit. Now, what the pilots generally do is, there is a list of actions that he has to perform 
and most pilots look at the list and tick off what they are doing and what has to be done next. This can create a problem. So, to address this problem, the machine or the onboard computer also keeps on checking what actions have been taken and what things have been ticked off. If at the end of this whole procedure of finalizing the flight plan, something is not completed, it can prompt the pilot saying that this step was not completed, so complete this step. So, although pilots are good in terms of doing a number of checks, it might so happen that because of short term memory failure, some step is overlooked. The machine is more rigorous in doing routine jobs and so what it could do is could prompt. There are a number of times you will see that you are doing a job perfectly, but your computer gives you suggestions on how to do it. We think of these suggestions as stupid, but then think of it in terms of why it was made. It was made to make you realize that this step is essential. Even if you are doing it, the fact that an additional warning comes in or additional suggestion comes in only improves your performance or brings your attention back to the job you are doing. And so, in this way, the training of individuals using the principles of experimental psychology and learning from experimental psychology can create better operators who can work with advanced systems for improving performances. So, this was another in, uh, interesting point in the history of engineering psychology. Now, industrial organization psychologists were also used during World War II to address some of the problems that engineering psychologists were doing. But then, as I have pointed before, one problem that they were facing is that they could select and train individuals to fit the job. But at the beginning of this section, I explained to you how it was not working. It was simply not working because no matter how hard or how efficiently you train individuals to fit jobs, individuals are bound by cognitive and physical capacities and because of this, they might be failures of action. So, instead, engineering psychologists were called in who looked at how machines were designed, the design of machines and with the study of design of machine and with the knowledge that they have about human systems, both cognitive and physical, they design systems in such a way that eliminated errors caused by faulty design. They upgraded the design in such a way that it did all those work which humans could not do because they are bound by certain cognitive and physical limitations. One example here could be learning a sequence of steps. Now, if you do a job in a sequenced manner, it will always give you positive results. This is basically the principle of using algorithms. But human brains are a noisy thing. They do not always follow algorithms. The brains are made in such a way that they look for shortcuts or heuristics. So, when we know that human brains think about heuristics, why not design a system in such a way that keep tracks of the algorithmic step of any action and if somewhere the human takes a heuristic in such a way that it bypasses an important algorithmic step in the functioning of a particular system, an error can be flagged. The example that I gave in terms of flight plan checks, this is this example can be better suited here. The pilots do a flight plan check in a sequence manner and if they forget something, the system can flag an error and this way the system as well as the operator can work in coordination, coherence and 
can lead to a better performance. Now, the end of World War II from 1945 to the present is the third stage of the history of engineering psychology and this stage is called the age of machines of mind. The focus of this era was not about how machines are designed but rather how minds function and if you study the human mind and the machine in relation to each other then you will have a much efficient system with higher performance and lower errors and fatigue. So, in this stage of history of engineering psychology, extensive usage of experimental psychologists took place. These experimental psychologists determines the laws of behavior and use these laws of behavior to focus on applied problems while developing theories as to why problems arose. So, these experimental psychologists did not only use their knowledge of human behavior of how behavior functions to solve applied problems, they also looked at why problems actually arose. Again looking back into the cockpit example, humans while making a flight plan should go sequentially in the number of pre-flight checks, but as I said human brains generally do not follow order, they try to always do a shortcut and errors which may occur is because of this simple reason that human brains are noisy things and say what they do is they assume that certain steps have already taken place. If you are familiar with the idea of writing a paper, there are at times when you write a paper and you give it to a supervisor and he points up an error saying that this sentence is not written. Now, in your mind you have written that sentence and no matter how many times you read that paper, you still see the sentence because it is in your head. This is a problem of closure within the human mind, but the supervisor has a different mind and he is not able to find that. If you find language learning tools, they also will point up these errors. And so, because human minds tend to behave in this way, errors can creep up. Now, by looking at why errors occur and what could be the solution to these errors, experimental psychologists not only redesigned the human machine system, but also looked at where errors can occur and what can be done to reduce the errors. And one suggestion that they gave was the machine simultaneously checks your input. You just do not have to check the pre-flight procedures on a pen and paper you have to input into a computer and once you do not input something or you fail to input something incorrectly, the warning system will tell you that this has been put in a wrong sequence or an incorrect sequence. So, this is how experimental psychologists help in designing systems and finding errors. Experimental psychologists, they conducted tests to monitor human performances within various scenarios to determine variables related to poor performances. Why do humans perform poorly? Now, there can be a lot of reasons and experimental psychologists were hired to look at human machine systems in various environments and scenarios and what these psychologists did was they looked at why the performance was suffering. One good example which comes to mind is a classic study in organization psychology and that is the use of lighting. It was found that the, with the increase in lighting, humans performances tend to increase and this idea of using lighting or increasing lighting to increase performance uh, relates back to the idea that with more light the phobia becomes more active and it sends a signal to the brain to be more active and more conscious. If lesser lights are there or a dim light is present, this suggests the brain to go into a non-conscious or resting mode and through this performance decreases. Now, this concept of how this lighting affects the human systems and which in turn affects their 
operator's action which leads to performances on uh, systems which finally leads to proficiency this is bound by this relation. So, experimental psychologists they tested performances in various scenarios and found out what could be the possible reason for performance decrement fatigue and provided solutions as to how to get rid of this fatigue. Aviation and air traffic control studies provided knowledge to understand the fundamentals of human performance and help design tools. Studies in air traffic control and aviation suggested why a number of accidents were happening, air accidents were happening and one thing that they proposed was something called visual design. Now, one problem that experimental psychologists found out is that a number of air accidents happen because the pilots do not realize that they are pulling the wrong lever for lowering the wheels. So, using visual design a wheel was made on the lever which operated the wheel and since it is in front of the pilot it becomes easier for him to know that this is the wheel and this is the flap and so he would not have any confusion. So, this idea of using visual design came from the study which was done by experimental psychologists. So, this marks the history of uh, engineering psychology. Let us look at some important events which happened in the history of human factor engineering or engineering psychology. First, the founding of the psychology branch of Aero Medical Laboratory was done by Paul Fitz. This is one event. This is uh, during the late 1960s or 70s, I get 50s or 60s. And during that, Paul Fitz, one of the major champions in engineering psychology, he started this psychology branch of the Aero Medical Laboratory. Paul Fitz gave something called Fitz law, which describes human actions and size of devices or size of controls and there is a relation between how far you are from a control and how big a control is. So, this relationship between control size and the separation between the operator and the control is de uh, defined by something called Fitz law and Fitz suggests that the more further you are from a control the bigger control should be required. This simple aspect is called Fitz law and Fitz discovered this and he also founded this Aero Medical Laboratory which is a major landmark in the history of human factors. Another landmark is the founding of the Ergonomic Research Society of Britain. This was another important event in the engineering psychology domain. The first book of Applied Experimental Psychology, Human Factors in Engineering Design was published by Chapins, Garland and Morgan and the Journal of Ergonomics was started in 1957 which also marked a major step into the furthering of engineering psychology discipline. Similarly, the Human Factor Society was formed in the United States and the Society of Engineering Psychology which became division 21 in the American Psychological Association was another two events in the development of field of engineering psychology. Some historical events for example, the launching of the Sputnik by the former USSR also led to the development of this field. Now, there was a time when the US and Russia were in cold war and they were competing for technical super, uh, superiority and one field in which this technical superiority was easily seen was space race. Now, Russia launched the Sputnik, the first series of space vehicles to show how technically advanced they are and when they did this, the Americans and other world people, they thought how to compete with Russia. But 
space probes and putting man into space was not an easy job. It required a lot of input from engineering psychologists and experimental psychologists and other people from other field as well into designing systems which can not only withstand space but carry humans to space and make them live. Space has no gravity, no weather, no atmosphere and so how should things be designed so that people can go in space and there also this launching of the Sputnik was an important event in the history of experimental human engineering. The founders of the field are Alphonse Chepnes who was a vicarious reader and he did a lot of studies and Paul Fitz who was a mechanical engineer working with the army and is known for his Fitz law. Some critical events which have an impact onto the growth of human factor engineering was the 1979 Three Mile Island nuclear power plant incident in which because of a failure from the side of the operator led to the meltdown of the core of this nuclear plant and because of this the whole atomic program of the United States were put on hold for some time. During the 1986 the Chernobyl nuclear power plant happened. The fourth tower cooling tower it imploded and because of that a lot of lives were lost. The whole city of Chernobyl which is now in Ukraine uh, it got a huge amount of radiation and for years to come people could not live there and this was because of one simple mistake by an operator because he overrode a input from a faulty machine. So, he read the faulty machine and did not verify it with the actual system and took a decision because of this the meltdown happened. And then there is the Challenger space shuttle uh, where the faulty o-ring created the crash of this Challenger series of rockets. In 2003 the Columbia space shuttle it crashed on re-entry because of a faulty tile exterior tile which could have been modified but the cosmonauts and astronauts thought that it is not that important because of this the whole accident happened. This is also a, a engineering psychology or experimental psychology related problem people thought that it is not important whereas it somehow became important at the point of entry. And of course, the September 11 incident 9-11 as we call them because of which the scanning systems and airports became more rigid and more advanced. So, these events led to the further development of engineering psychologists. Now, the current directions engineering psychology in today's world looks at aviation and military applications, development of air related or aeroplane related applications and military related applications. Another field of application is computer systems looking at advanced computers uh, that could do quantum computing or qubit computing, development of consumer products, development of softwares and web interfaces and air traffic control and space flight. So, all these uh, areas engineering psychology has moved into and are helping the development of newer and better systems. Design of medical systems so certain kind of medical system for example, port portable uh, life support systems or portable uh, defibrillators these are another uh, field in which engineering psychologists are helping. Designing toys for children these toys are not only safe these toys are also educational. So, how to design new toys? In forensic systems also uh, engineering psychologists have started helping and creating a, a better man machine interaction. So, that forensic science could move forward and in terms of education. So, now you have this virtual classes and e classes and the one class that we are presently doing uh, the design of this or the thought of this came from the mind of some 
educator and some engineering psychologist somewhere. Current directions also include the human computer interface studying how humans and computers interact, how users interact with computers and how to design interfaces. Now, HCI emphasizes something called UX or user design or user centered design and how design adheres to the expectations and experiences of wide range of products. So, making systems and interfaces in such a way that it understands the users and creates lesser load on users. The concept of user centered design where design evaluation and redesign is done. In user centered design, the users are brought in right from the start of conceptual conceptualization of a product. So, in the first step itself where the thought of making a product or a system comes up, users are bought in and uh, they are discussed. Then when the design or uh, the observations of uh, designers who design these new products are over, again the users are called in and their views are taken. Then people who work with older systems which needs to be modified, they are studied, they are talked with and actual users who will be using the system are again called in and a thorough brainstorming session happens and at the end of it when a prototype of the new system comes in, again the users are called in who will be using a particular product and uh, they are talked with and the system is still made better. So, that the first version of the system is uh, more proficient and more efficient. So, including users in the whole design process is user centered design. Human factor engineering is also used in something called product design and in medication errors also for example, people die because a wrong uh, leg is amputated or uh, overdose of certain thing, uh, certain medications are done and so correct to correct these inputs from human engineering are taken wherein the machine assists the doctors in terms of taking critical decisions in uh, the medical field. Now, the engineering psychologist follows a system design and so what is the system design? In a system design, the classic system design there is an input, there is an output and there is a, a process. So, the process is between the input and output and the interdependence of system components uh, are there in a system design. So, most engineering psychologists or most problems related to engineering psychology follow something called a system design. Now, most systems have follow something called an IPO, IPO uh, model which has an input process and output and in a number of times the output feedbacks to the input. For example, I am using a printer. Now, there is an input, I input something into the printer, it processes and it outputs and looking at what the output is will decide whether I want to go ahead and print in the same manner or should I change the layout of the printing. So, this is a simple IPO system. Now, most systems are either closed loop or open loop. Closed loop systems are those systems where the system can be modified while it is working. So, uh, for example, driving, when you are driving, things can be changed or machines can be modified, machine designs can be modified so that driving becomes a uh, more uh, easy or more entertaining job for you and open lo loop systems are those which once starts cannot be modified when uh, till the process is complete. Uh, so, there we lose something called iterative design. For example, if you throw a ball in air, till the ball lands, you cannot change the path of this ball. So, this is an open loop system. Now, while applying psychology to design, a more user friendly world can be created and for this, we have to realize three things. First, most systems have a goal. So, we have to think about the goals of the system and how this human computer interaction can help the goal. We have to consider all components, not only the input, but also the process components and the output component of a machine human uh, relation or machine human process and consider how components could or do interact. We have to also look at what are the possible ways in which various components of a system interact. For example, how does the inputting of a page for printing and how does printing they interact and what can and what cannot happen. If you give the wrong command, the wrong printing will happen. If you do give the wrong command, the printer would not print at all. And so, what all commands can uh, the person give and what all outputs can be generated. So, if a wrong command is given, how can the machine 
identify a wrong command is there and correct it on its own so that it doesn't put too much load on the user. So there are a number of times when uh, a spell check is a good example here. So if you write the wrong spelling, spell checks could sometimes automatically correct. So this is the importance of uh, the uh, human machine relationship and how the system theory helps in understanding problems and making corrections into this problem. So, this is the end of lecture 2. In a quick re recap, I would like to suggest what we have done in this lecture. So, we looked at the history and we also looked at how the IO psychology and engineering psychology differ and further to it we looked at the current directions of this engineering psychology discipline. In the next lectures when we meet we will discuss more about engineering psychology, more focus on to other aspects of engineering psychology and till we meet again it is thank you and goodbye from the MOOC studio.